I did want to just reiterate uh, one item that we're excited about, and that is with regard to next week's service. Uh, we're excited to have our friend, uh, Jonathan Reed, with us. Uh, we, we've known him for a long time, and he's been a part of our church ministry in a way in a long, for a long time as we've supported Fostering Hope. Um, we're excited about the event of having our mind brought toward National Foster Awareness Month, um, but even more so about celebrating um, God's work in and through uh, Ben and Abby Newman and the call upon us as a church to come alongside of them through that process as a support to them and to those children that will come into their lives. And it'll be a great opportunity for us to be vessels of God's goodness. So we're excited about that. Uh, following the service, there will be a time of uh, refreshments down in the fellowship hall, light refreshments and coffee uh, that you'll be uh, invited and encouraged to participate in as we reflect upon that time. Now let's take a moment. We'll open our Bibles to John 14. And we'll ask God for his gracious blessing upon our worship of him in light of his word. Father, thank you. Thank you for all that you are, all that you've done, all that you provide for us. Thank you for your word and the opportunity to sing, to pray, and then to meditate upon your word. We pray that you would do your work of opening our eyes deepening our understanding, firming up our faith, and maybe for some among us who have never come to know Jesus as their Savior, maybe even today you'll open their eyes unto faith in Christ that would result in eternal life. We commit this to you with confidence because we trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. So who here has been to a fireworks display? Um, maybe you've been to McCoy Stadium and watched the, the fireworks there, or maybe you've been to Narragansett Beach and watched the fireworks over the water. Um, does one of these events stand out in your mind? Like this, oh, this was the most spectacular, uh, fireworks display. Are there any that stand out in your mind? Um, I, I've had a number in my mind that, that really are in competition. Down in, in Disney, Disney World, they have spectacular shows, uh, fireworks and laser light displays, kind of the, the fireworks are going off and, and in, in, tune, like in coordination with the music and sometimes there's like pictures that are shown, like all kinds of stuff going on. It's just spectacular, all of these displays. One is spectacular, maybe one is more spectacular than the other, but one thing is for sure, we are drawn to the spectacular. We're drawn to that which um, captures our attention. The works that Jesus and his disciples performed were not just to display the spectacular, but to authenticate the truth proclaimed. The real work, the work of showing the provision of eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord, this was accomplished through God opening people's eyes. And one of the ways was through these spectacular displays of his glory. But ultimately, it was not about just having someone's mouth wide open, jaw-dropping moments or mind-blowing moments. It was to, to get to the point that a person could see that God loves them and loves them in Christ that God would be willing to take our sin, remove it forever, place it on Christ, and provide us with eternal life. That work that has been accomplished through Jesus Christ on the cross is still being applied here in 2024. The work accomplished is still being applied every day around this world. People are coming to know Jesus as Savior 
every day around this globe, people are having their sins forgiven and Jesus' righteousness provided. All because of something that took place 2,000 years ago in history and beyond that, all because of something God accomplished before the foundation of the world. Because anything God purposes, He brings to pass. It's amazing. The works of the Father that were seen through the ministry of Jesus would continue in the ministry of the apostles and beyond. Jesus makes the intriguing statement in our text that those who believe in him would do greater works than the ones they saw in Jesus with this important phrase, because I go to the Father. You will do greater works than these because I go to the Father. Look at the text here in John 14, starting in verse 12. It says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will will do it. He says, you're going to do greater works. The word there for greater is megas. Mega. Megas. Greater works than these you'll do because I go to the Father. The works of Jesus would be entreated through prayer. You can see that in the text. Entreated through prayer. Anything you ask in my name, I'll do it. If you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. Entreated through prayer. Secondly, it would be accomplished through Jesus Christ. Both in verse 13 and in verse 14, it says, I will do it. I will do it. So it's entreated through prayer, accomplished by Christ. And then thirdly, it will be magnifying and glorifying the Father. You see that at the end of verse 13, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Emphatically, Jesus told them, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. That's an incredible statement. It is amazingly emphatic. He says, I'm going to take care of this. Ask anything in my name, I will do it. It reminds us of what Jesus dealt with in Matthew chapter 17. In Matthew chapter 17, he was talking to his disciples and he says, if, if you have even a, a faith a, the, the size of the grain of mustard seed, I will move mountains. I will move mountains. And then he concludes that section. He says, nothing will be impossible for you. It's like these are some drastic, emphatic statements that Jesus is making about himself. Now, what's interesting is he tells us in both verse 13 and 14 that these things are asked for in my name. If anyone asks anything in my name. Now, know this, that Jesus' name is representative of who he is. Representative of his character, his nature. His purpose. So Jesus' promise here in verses 13 and 14 relates to requests or prayers that are part of his greater mission. To ask something in Jesus' name is not just like a magic formula, an incantation. Slap in Jesus' name on the end of it, and of course I will do it. It's not that. These requests in Jesus' name are based upon his character and based upon his purposes. So he's incorporating the disciples, both then and there in the first century, and you and I here in the 21st century, he's incorporating his disciples into his mission and his purposes. And so as we're going along and being desiring to be vessels of God's good work, What we're saying is, God, let my life, let my words, let this this work 
be something that is reflective of your nature, your character, your purpose. And what really did happen is you'll see in the, the book of Acts, which we'll look at in a few moments here, what we'll see is the works that Jesus was doing in those gospel periods were continuing in the lives of the apostles. So let's take a look there at Acts chapter 3. The apostles performed the works of Jesus. We're going to look at a, a number of texts here. We're just going to hit and run on these texts, but I want for us to see the miraculous, that God's work in Jesus, which displayed the miraculous again and again, were on display also in his followers, the disciples, the apostles. Those things were perpetuated in their lifetime. The apostles performed the works of Jesus. So we're in Acts chapter 3. Take a look at verses 1 through 10. It says, now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. Give me something. Give me some, some money. I need help. As Peter directed his, uh, his gaze at him, as did John, they said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I, what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entering the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with spectacular wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So they're just going about their business. They're heading into the temple asking. He's asking for some money. Give, give me something. I'm, I'm dying over here. I'm, I'm hurting. I need help. I don't have anything to give you except what you, <laughs> what you probably weren't even asking for that's going to meet a deeper need than you ever thought I could give you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Rise and walk, lifts him up. And this guy stands and walks and leaps and praises God. This is a continuation of some of the works that we see in the gospel periods under the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, look a little further, look at chapter 5. This is more uh, uh, generality here in, in Acts chapter 5. What we'll see is like in mass, in Great numbers, the miraculous that are taking place through the lives and ministries of the apostles. Acts chapter 5, look at verses 12 through 16. It says, Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the, the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits. And we read the last one, two, three, four, five words with me. And they were all healed they were all healed. They're bringing out, like in mass, all these people with all these sicknesses and all the people that are uh, afflicted with, with being uh, oppressed and possessed by demons. They're bringing them out into the streets, and all of them are healed, person after person after person, continuing the works of Jesus. Look at chapter 9. Look at chapter 9. This is ratchets it up just a, a touch here in Acts chapter 9. I'm going to read verses 36 to 42. We're going to be introduced to a, a lady named Dorcas. Um, I hope there are no Dorcases here. Um, 
I would not want to be named Dorcas. I don't know about you, but her name is written in Scripture forever with this incredible account. So we'll never forget Dorcas. Acts chapter 9, look at verse 36. Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days she became ill and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Sounds like a sad story. It would be. It probably was a very sad story. Verse 38, since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went to them. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the windows, uh, widows stood beside him, weeping and showing, uh, showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter pulled, put them all outside and knelt down and prayed and turned to the body or turning to the body he said Tabitha arise see what it says next she opened her eyes she was dead they they washed her up laid her on a bed he says Tabitha arise and her eyes opened this is like strange, right? We don't see dead people rising. But here in this context, she opened her eyes and when they saw, when she saw Peter, she sat up and he gave her his hand and raised her up and calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa and many believed in the Lord. This is happening again and again. You see it all through the, the Acts of the Apostles. Just something as simple as, you know, Peter is in prison and there's a gathering of God's people and they're praying for him. And an angel of the Lord comes, this is in Acts chapter 12, an angel of the Lord comes in the night, frees him from prison. He goes to the place where they're praying. He's knocking on the door and, and Rhoda co comes to the door, sees him out there, is like, hey, Peter's at the door. They're like, yeah, you're out of your mind. You're crazy. They're praying for, for Peter's deliverance. He comes to the door and is knocking. Rhoda says, he's at the door. No, no, you're crazy. There's something wrong with you. It must be an angel. It must be a spirit of some sort. No, no, it's not, it's not an angel. God delivered Peter from prison and brought him to your door where you are praying for his deliverance. Acts chapter 20 Paul, this, is, this, is, this might be my favorite story. Paul preached someone to death. He was preaching so long, the guy fell asleep, and he fell down from a high position, and there he is, dead on the floor. Now, this is not, doesn't sound like a great story, but like for preachers, it kind of sounds like... I, he, I'm, I've never preached so long that someone died, so like I, I've, I've got one up on Paul in that regard. But what happened next is why we're actually referencing it. He preached him to death and then raised him from the dead. This is the continuation of Jesus' work. What, was it just so that people would be in awe of the spectacular? No. No, it was to prove something. Acts, uh, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 2 says it this way. Listen to these words. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read to you Acts 2 verses 3 and 4. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared, salvation was declared at first by the Lord, and that salvation was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to His will. The spectacular signs and wonders, they are amazing. And in some ways, wouldn't we all be happy if we could go down into the hospitals down the street from here, down in Providence, down in South County, or wherever, uh, maybe in some of the hospitals, the children's hospitals in Boston, we can go in there and walk around and just say, you know, 
receive your sight and receive your, your strength in your legs and be gone with you tumors. And I, I would, I would, that would be, seems like it would be such a wonderful blessing. And yet that, that's, not, that's not the end of, of the miracles. You see, you can have cancer and if someone laid their hands on you and miraculously God took that cancer away, you will eventually die from something else. No one's going to live on physically forever. What we really need is not physical healing, though we certainly like that. And I don't discount that. What we really need is not physical healing, but spiritual healing. We need to be raised from spiritually dead to spiritually alive. And all of those miracles that Jesus was performing was to authenticate his Messiahship. And all of those miracles that the apostles then were, were performing were to authenticate their apostleship. Meaning these are emissaries of Christ. Those that are sent with this message. But the, the miracles were not the point. They were to let people know that the message of the apostles which is the message of Jesus, is that there is forgiveness and righteousness and life through Christ alone. So the, the apostles continued on the works of Christ. Our experience as God's vessels, the, what, the, what those works look like are a little different, right? Right? Again, like if, if, we, if I could heal someone's paralysis, that would be, I would be delighted to do that if it led them to know Jesus. And yet, um, in, in this day and age, it doesn't, you know, God has not chosen to utilize those miraculous things through people, people's hands. Now, certainly there are miracles that take place all the time that God does at his own discretion but not through the laying on of hands or the anointing of oil or uh, you know, strong proclamation in some public healing service. God does what God does. And yet God has still called us to continue because when we're, we're in John 14, right? And he's talking about those who believe in me will do the works that I do. There is an application here that, that leads further than the apostolic age here into the church age and into this day and age right now. There, there are ways in which God is telling us through Christ that, that we're going to continue his work, but what does that look like? It's not the same. Take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13 for a moment. Believers performing the works of Jesus. We saw the apostles performing those works, and they looked in similar kind. As believers work the works of Jesus, it's going to look different. Take a look at at 1 Corinthians 13. Look at verses 1 through 3 to begin with. God's word says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. So the first one, in verse 1, the, 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 the emphatic, hyperbolic statement is, if I could speak as eloquently as angels speak, whenever an angel spoke, the human receiver understood exactly what they said clear clear to the point in whatever language the person spoke they heard that language right so we're talking about perfect articulation a perfect clear message but if i don't have love i'm just bong 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 i'm not accomplishing anything the second the hyperbolic 
condition, oh, if I have all these prophetic powers and I understand every single ministry, uh, uh, mystery and I, I have all knowledge and I have this kind of great faith that moves mountains, but I don't have love, I am nothing. Not only do I accomplish nothing, it's like there, I've, I'm, I'm getting nothing done. I, there's nothing for me to give if I'm doing all these things. Spectacular, but no love. And he goes on in verse three, if I give away all that I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. There's no, there's no product here. His point is, at the heart of the work of God and the work of God through his people it has to be love. And love, love we, we talk about falling in love and falling out of love. You can read all kinds of books on love. You can have your love tank filled if you, you know, give the right gifts and say the right words of affirmation and do the right you know, things of service and touch just right. You know, all the, you know, the five love languages. You can fill everybody's love tank. No. We're talk- love in the Scriptures comes from God. It is completely different than anything we manufacture through reading a book. Love that comes from God is impossible for us except by the Spirit of God who dwells in us. Here's what it looks like in verses 4 and following. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things things endures all things love never ends all right get out a little piece of paper and tell me how you're doing on a scale of one to ten how you doing with those if you're honest you don't even put a one is there is there a category less than one Can I be like a negative six? If you're honest, you understand that the emphatic, continuous, grandiose picture that God is painting of this love puts us in a position of like, yeah, I can't, I can't do that. I'm not patient kind. I'm not without irritability. I'm not without rudeness. It, 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 it paints us in a position of need, which is good news because the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5 that God shed his love abroad in our hearts by His Spirit, whom He has given to us. So love comes from Him. He is the source of it. The works continuing from Jesus into our age come around this subject matter of love. If you think about how Jesus answered the question about the greatest commandment, It's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. And that love for God and that love for one another requires from us to say, God, I don't don't have that. I need I need 
the source of this work of Jesus flows from the work of Jesus. So to continue Jesus' work of love displayed in various ways requires a reception of His love and then being a channel of His love. Not figuring out how to be better at loving, but figuring out how to allow His love that He's already clearly displayed toward us can flow through us as we seek to be vessels of His goodness. Now there are a lot of different ways we could look at this. Uh, We'll take just a moment. Take a look at Galatians chapter 6. In chapter 5 and verse 13, I'll read this while you're turning. He says, You are called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. In verse 22 of the same chapter, the fruit of the Spirit is love. In Galatians chapter 6, look at verses 1 and 2. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression or trespass, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness, keeping watch on yourself, lest you too are tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. He's he's talking about coming alongside of others. bearing, Bearing their burdens with them. How do we do that? By pointing them back to Christ. The only one that can bear that burden is Him. Trespasses. Crossing over a line. Disregarding others. Demonstrating our brokenness. All of these things were dealt with by Christ on the cross. And we point people back to Him. Look at what He's done. Look at how He loves us. Knowing all that we are. Knowing that in this moment you were going to fail. He he loved you to the end. That's who He is. So we bear one another's burdens. Uh, We want to be reflective of of our Father. Ephesians 5 talks about that. Be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love. Um, So Jesus says back in John 14 that you're going to do the works of my Father. The works that I do. But then he says, you're going to do greater works. You're going to do greater works. So in in my outline, I I know it's not on the screen here, I have Roman numeral three, performing greater works than Jesus, comma, what? (laughs) Performing greater works than Jesus, what? All right, so let's think it through. Are my works going to be better than turning water into wine? Better than calming a storming sea instantly? Better than giving sight to a blind man? Will my works be better than Jesus taking the corrosive tissue of a man afflicted with leprosy and turning it into baby-like flesh? Will my works be better than Jesus raising Lazarus, who had been dead for four days, back to life? What what are we saying here? See, we, we tend to glorify the successes of the moment. We can be enamored with little kingdoms, the little kingdoms of today. So much of today's success is simply going to be a little footnote in history. You know what a footnote is when you're reading the book? There's that little little, uh, superscription. Sometimes they have a footnote at the bottom of the page, which is helpful. Sometimes they have the end note at the end of the book. So you're trying to read this book 
And you're like, oh, I really want to see what this footnote says. But it's not at the bottom of the page. So you're going to go all the way to the back of the book. And by the time you get there, you're like, oh, uh, what, what number was it? That's kind of what the successes of this age are like. Little footnotes that get lost. Maybe somewhere they're remembered in some history book. But eventually, it's all going to be ground to powder and forgotten. We may debate who is the greatest basketball player of all time or who is the greatest football player of all time or who is the greatest businessman of all time or even the greatest physician. But much of this is simply tied to this age. When Jesus talks about greater works, he's referring to that which endures. Healing a man's blindness is thrilling. But that man that, whose eyes were blinded physically, he ended up being blinded again physically. Right? That guy who's received life in his legs at the, at the temple, eventually his legs had no life in them again. Right? It happens to everyone. Everyone that comes into this world, also dies. And when you die, you're blind and deaf and mute and unable to walk or do anything physically. Demonstrating sacrificial love for someone is a good tribute to the nature of God. And yet, the impact of these, the healing of that blind man, was more than about his physical sight. It was about him seeing who Jesus really is and about people around seeing who Jesus really is and us, as we read, seeing who Jesus really is. And that sight is never taken away. And that life that God gives through understanding who Jesus is is never taken away. We tend to stop things at the temporal and God is pointing us toward the eternal. We're looking at the physical, and God is trying to tell us about the spiritual. So Jesus says, you're going to do the works that I do, and greater works than these, and the reason because, that you're going to do that is because I am going to the Father. Jesus accomplished the work that was needed. Remember on the cross? He said, it is finished. And what was finished? He fulfilled the law and he fulfilled the purposes of the Father. And he laid his life down as a once for all sacrifice for our sin. He died that we might live. He took our sins that we might have righteousness. He took on death that we might have life. This is what he accomplished. And as he goes to the Father. He empowers us, His followers, to proclaim that work that He has accomplished. And in doing so, He rules over all principality and rule and might and dominion in every name that's named in Ephesians chapter 1. And He says, all this authority on heaven and earth is given to me. And he says, go therefore with that authority. My authority is going with you. As you tell people the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're going with my authority based upon what I've accomplished. In Acts chapter 2, tells us how, how Jesus went to the Father and He sent us His Spirit. The Spirit comes with power to take the physical to help us see the spiritual. So I want to look at this for just a moment. Take a look at Acts chapter 2. So we'll take just a, a couple of moments here. During Jesus' ministry, as he performed act after act, and you know the, the crowd was growing, there were tangible results of growing numbers of followers. But the ensuing application of Jesus' work through the apostles increased that influence and spread the kingdom of God exponentially. So there was evidence of Jesus' saving work even during His ministry, but what took place on the other side of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and the coming of the Spirit is the broadening 
deepening, widening expanse of God redeeming people like us. Amen. He's still doing it today. Look at Acts chapter 2, please, in verse 41. It says, so those who received his word were baptized and there were added that day about, what? 3,000 souls. Look down at verse 47. They were gathered together. They were praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were, what? Being saved. Look at chapter 4 and verse 4. It says in chapter 4 and verse 4 of the book of Acts, but many of those who had heard the word believed and the number of men came to about, what is the next word? 5,000. Look at chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Let's start in verse 32. It says, Now as Peter went here and there, among them all, he came down also to the saints who lived in Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, bedridden for eight years, who was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he arose. Verse 35. And all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him. Will you read the end of the verse with me? And they turned to the Lord. That's the real work. That's the real work. And they turned to the Lord. It's not about the healing. It's not about the sight. It's about they turned to the Lord. It's about God taking the work of Jesus and opening people's eyes and opening people's hearts that they would believe Him to be all that He says He is, to have accomplished all that He says He has accomplished, giving life and light forever. This is the real work. This is a lasting work. And so the apostles, day by day, gathered together every day in the temple and from house to house. They did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. And thus the church has been commissioned to continue day by day proclaiming the same message, which is what the Bible tells us in Colossians 1.28. Listen to these words. Simple. Three words. Him we proclaim. Him we proclaim. We're not proclaiming the greatest church in history, the greatest pastor in history, the greatest denomination in history, the greatest anything in history except the greatest hero in history. His name is Jesus Christ. As the church has continued to go forth with the gospel, continuing Jesus' work, the impact has increased with such staggering numbers that it's hard to fathom. I know we feel outnumbered. I know we look around and say, what in the world is happening here? And yet all around the globe today, all around the globe today, People are gathering in the name of Jesus Christ. And they're saying, look to Him. Receive from Him. Believe Him. And today, today, many will come to know Jesus as their Savior. God has invited us into this process of what He has accomplished. He has done the work it's finished. And yet we have the privilege of seeing it applied in history. One day, I want you to think, just envision with me for a second. One day, we're going to be surrounded with millions upon billions who have experienced the redemption 
that has been accomplished by Jesus Christ. And we're going to be proclaiming with one mouth and one voice, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive glory and wisdom and might and riches and strength. He is worthy. This day is coming when we're surrounded with believers. And like Jesus' disciples who were uncertain about all that was lying ahead, we too experience the uncertainty of the process. But we have assurance regarding the fulfillment of God's purposes. Right now, today, in these days that remain, we seek to be vessels of God's work of love most clearly as we point people to His loving, merciful, kind provision in Jesus. He is the spectacle. He is the spectacular. The power comes from Him. The life comes from Him. And the Father is glorified in His Son, our Savior. So we ask God, God, please, will You help others to experience Your good? Will You help us to savor the goodness that You have displayed through Christ? May people hear of your good, good work done through Jesus Christ and may they come to know him. Please give them life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.